No, Elia, good morning. Good morning. I'm sorry I'm missing you in person. Okay, I think we can start, and I hope some more people will join during the presentation. So I'm very happy to be here in our first hybrid uh, seminar for the Bionic for Women uh, program, of which I am a collaborator. And it's a very pleasure to present today Noelia Ferruz. Uh, she studied chemistry at the University of Zaragoza, and then she made a master in bioinformatics at the Pompeu Fabra University here in Spain. Then she undertook her PhD in the field of computational biophysics at the Barcelona Biomedical Research Park, PRBB. And after a short stay as a postdoctoral researcher in the neuroscience department in Pfizer in Boston, she did her postdoc in Beirut, Germany, in the protein design group of Professor Birte Höcker. Since April, she has been a Beatrice de Pinot Fellow at the Institute of Informatics and Applications at the University of Girona, where she has been focusing on implementing neural models for protein engineering and design. I'm, I have to personally say that I am impressed by the work of Noelia. Uh, whoever is in the field of structural bioinformatics maybe has seen some of her recent work. So Noelia, we are very happy to have you here and I hope you enjoy the seminar. Thank you very much, Gonzalo. That was a very nice introduction. I hope everyone can hear me well. I'm gonna share my screen and cross fingers that everything works. Uh, Right. Okay. I hope you can see my presentation now. Also in person people. Okay. So yeah, thanks again. And thanks for the invitation. Today, I will present my talk entitled Towards Controllable Protein Design with Deep Unsupervised Models. And as Gonzalo said, I'm currently working as a Beatrice de Pinas Fellow at the University of Girona at the Institute of Informatics and Applications. Okay, <clears throat> so I have to press. Okay, um, we are witnessing an unprecedented information explosion in the last years. Here, I took the data for the um, data that we are generating for information, and uh, we observed that the amount of data in zettabytes, which is or one zettabyte is a trillion gigabytes that we are generating, it's increasing exponentially. Only the amount of data that we generated in 2018, it was 33 zettabytes, which is in more standard measures, around 330 million hard drives. Uh, most of this data is unstructured, which is why we're also seeing uh, this explosion in many machine learning methods, because machine learning or deep neural networks are very good at capturing patterns within unstructured data. But this is not only happening in uh, information explosion or internet data. This is also that we are something we are observing in biological databases. In here, I show the protein data bank, and uh, we can see that the amount of entries that have been deposited over the last 20 years have been increasing exponentially. So in light blue, the number of entries that we have every year. Um, so given the hardware and software advances that we are witnessing. For example, in hardware recently, we saw the release of the NVIDIA Ampere 100 cards or algorithms like the transformer architecture. Uh, even though we are seeing a lot of advances in harnessing all this unannotated data, we could uh, still do a lot more learning from uh, the advances that we are seeing from learning from the unstructured data from the internet. So I'm gonna focus my talk on how over the last years, I focused during my PhD and postdocs to uh, either generate high throughput data or analyze high throughput uh, databases to generate predictions for drug discovery and protein design. I will first briefly mention my work during my PhD uh, at the PRBB here in Barcelona. Uh, I was very fortunate to do my PhD here, not only because, as you know, it's an incredible location, but also because back then uh, we had access to over 3,000 3, GPUs. This happened with the GPU grid uh, framework, which is a platform where people all over the world, they share the GPUs. So we were able to submit the simulations. They were running the simulations for us, and then we could retrieve the simulations and do the analysis at home. 
this was uh, at the time a commodity because uh, GPUs were much more expensive than now. And with this, we could also run milliseconds of data. The way we were doing this, imagine we have a protein, a biological system, protein and ligand, and this is a simulation box. And each of these box, each of these boxes runs independently in a GPU. And then we had the 3000 GPUs. So we could run independent simulations for each of them. And in the end, we could gather the data and run the statistical analysis. So we were doing that with Markov state modeling in which, for example, the ligand binding to the protein, we could observe uh, the binding rate. So how fast does it bind and all the transition states in between. So other intermediate states for binding here, I show four states. Uh, the, bound sta the bound state is number four, but in between the, the, the ligand was interacting with other parts of the protein. So this was very powerful, not only to see the pathway, but also we could see uh, the energies for each of the binding states. Uh, we did this for many systems back then. So some examples, my first work, uh, we collected th this data for 42 compounds against uh, factor TM protein, which is involved in the population cascade. And I ran over two milliseconds of data. But then uh, later we applied this uh, during my time at Pfizer for, uh, uh, the characterization of uh, neurological compounds into GPCRs. We also apply this for protein-protein interactions. Uh, this is the uh, EGFR receptor involved in colorectal cancer. We also apply this to enzymes uh, to uh, decipher the binding mechanism of cofactors and substrates, and also recently for folding. My major point is that even if back then we, uh, we needed 3,000 GPUs, today we no longer need that. So I, on Friday, I took a simulation system, I took this protein, and then I put it in a simulation box of so water in explicit solvent, and it overall had 25,000 atoms. And then I tried several GPUs from a cluster I have access to, and then I, I look at how fast they were running. So. Uh, with one of the uh, most uh, affordable uh, GPUs we have today, uh, we can run a microsecond a day in a single GPU. This means that with 10 GPUs, we can run 10 microseconds a day. And of course, we don't need that much data. Sometimes we, we would like to run several replicas for different systems before passing through which ones are going to the lab. So um, this is something that now we can do in an in-house cluster. So as a summary for uh, the first part of my work, uh, now it is possible to, compl to completely characterize ligand binding and folding pathways in a single experiment. And uh, today clusters provide means to test thousands of replicas in, in weeks. Now I will pass through most of my uh, latest work, uh, which has been focusing on protein design. I did my this work during my postdoc at the University of Bayreuth and Professor at the group of Professor Birte Höcker. And, uh, and uh, as maybe you know, um, uh, the goal in protein design is that we finally have a protein that performs what we want. So for example, here I'm showing the deal cellular reaction and we ideally want to design a protein that we give the substrates, it could be also plastic and then it produces uh, an effect. But this is extremely challenging. So there are different ways in which we can do this. I like to classify these ways into how we approach the scaffold of the protein. Uh, one way which is ordered by complexity, we could say is taking one of the proteins that are available in uh, structural databases and repurpose it. So change it, change it slightly so that we can end up with a better function or a slightly change the function. Another way, <clears throat> Sorry, it will be to take um, proteins that we have in databases and then chunk them into pieces and then link these fragments into pieces so that we can end up with different proteins or cameras. And the most challenging way will be to like literally write the sequence on the paper and then hope that this sequence falls into the structure that we want and also that it performs the function that we want. Uh, this is the most challenging part. And during my postdoc, I focused on the second part. How this it all started uh, before I arrived to this, uh, to Professor Hoka's lab. Uh, they had observed that this protein, so we see it has blue and white parts. Uh, this is the imidazole glycerol phosphate synthase satin barrel. 
And they observed that the white part is extremely similar to the part that we see here in green. So they thought, okay, what happens if we take the green part in the lab and we put it where the white part is, does it work? And it, after a couple of rounds of optimization, this uh, yielded a, a stable protein, uh, which is the combination of two folds. They later observed that actually these two fragments are not only structurally similar, but also they have a homologous fragment in common, so they are evolutionary related. This is remarkably, remarkably important because it means that we can literally find other fragments like this through the protein space and then assemble all the possible combinations. And this is what I did. Um, I took a, a structural database, SCOP, and then for each of the proteins, I I did a hidden Markov model profile, and then I compared them all against all. Uh, with this, then we had um, for every two proteins, so uh, for, for each of them, a pairwise alignment where we find local fragments that are homologous. And then we later uh, structurally superimpose these fragments. And then all this data, we put it into um, uh, the FASL database. And if, once we had done this, one of the major questions was so, how many of these fragments are there in? In the protein universe, how do they look like? And then can we use them to build new proteins? And uh, the answer is there are many fragments. So in here, I uh, use uh, similarity networks to find the number of fragments. Each of the points in the protein in here in the universe is a protein. And we link two proteins whenever they have a fragment in common. So we see that the universe looks uh, uh, very sparse, but also condensed. So in here we have islands. Each of these islands is a fragment in common. And also we have a region which is very uh, evolutionary conserved. So it means that many of the proteins that present um, uh, unstructured alpha beta have fragments in common. Um, in overall, we found over 1,000 fragments uh, that now we can use and combine them uh, to create new proteins, but also they give us hints about evolutionary relationships between different proteins of different folds. For example, when we zoom in into the network, we see that in uh, example in example number one, uh, we have a thin barrel and a flavodoxin, and they share a fragment in common. It happens again in fragment two, it's a thin barrel and a flavodoxin, and they have a fragment in common. And some of these examples had already been uh, described in literature by other groups like uh, Andre Lupash. Uh, with this, then I decided to automatize the process. So given that we have all the information of all the fragments, so all the building blocks that are in the protein space, can we take them and start building chimeras? Um, yes, we can. So what I, I implemented for Lego and uh, is divided into five applications. The first one is that we can represent evolutionary relationships for proteins such as I just did uh, in, in the previous slide. And also we can focus on one particular evolutionary relationships, so two proteins like this that share a fragment in common and then build chimeras from them. And because we can build many chimeras in minutes, then uh, we can also score them. So before going to the lab and select those that have the best um, energy function according to Rosetta or uh, OpenMM. And then finally, we can also analyze these structures by a set of different uh, structural tools like whether they have hydrophobic clusters, cell bridges, and hydrogen networks. This tool is available uh, in, in GitHub um, as per Lego, and so you can download it freely. And also as a web, because many people were interested on this structural analysis, I made this available as a web server. So you can, for example, put in your protein and uh, analyze the uh, hydrophobic clusters that it, have, that it has Hydrophobic clusters are important for folding or uh, in general, it's structurally predict whether a protein will be stable. So this is available and you can access it here. Protein tools. There are other tools, but I'm sure we know the other uh, hydrophobic clusters here for time constraints. So uh, yeah. Also, uh, some of the questions that many people were asking us is what do we do? How can we control the function in these chimeras that we are building? And the, the, truth is, like, the truth is that in, in this example that I showed at the beginning, there were ligands. So uh, the ligand that is uh, binding originally is F, 
it's also present in the final chimera QYSF. This means that if we take fragments from the two parents protein, the two parent proteins, then we can build a chimera in the end that also contains the ligands. And this is remarkably important because we can also bring our ligands together and build this way possible enzymes. Uh, so I included uh, uh, into fossil oligons. This is the latest version of fossil, which is a database that contains all the available fragments in the protein space. And then you can directly look for fragments that are conserved in nature that are binding a specific ligand like NADA. Uh, and here I show for this search, this is the fragment and it's binding the ligand. And you can see the interactions uh, where the fragment is located in the protein and look at specifically at interactions uh, with the protein. And then later on, take this fragment and build the chimeras with protein level. So yeah, we can toggle and look at interactions specifically for NAE. And you can access the web in here at Fossil Univiral um, 2.0. Okay, as a summary for the uh, part where I build chimeras by or did protein design by using building blocks or uh, Lego blocks, uh, I will say that the fossil database collects evolutionary conserved fragments that are happening in nature with functional information as well. Uh, ProtLego can build cameras from these fragments automatically and analyze their fitness. And uh, I will then go for the last part, which is what I've been doing lately and also where I would like to focus on the next years. No, sorry. <clears throat> we are... Um, as I mentioned, um, we, we have different ways in which we can build proteins uh, or design proteins. And one of the most challenging one is focusing on de novo design. Uh, de, novo is remarkably, de novo design is remarkably challenging because the chances that you write a sequence and it falls and it does the function that you, uh, that you want are inf infinitesimally small. So it's very, very uh, challenging. So different ways have been uh, proposed over the years, the most traditional one was to use the Rosetta approach or any other software for protein design, which um, uh, what it does is to uh, define an er energy function, usually uh, defined with physical chemical terms like Van der Waals and so on, and then uh, uh, implement an algorithm that searches through this function and then in the end finds the most optimal sequence for a given protein. Uh, this has met a lot of success, in particular over the last year. So the Baker Lab is an example of uh, uh, a lab that is producing now dozens of uh, proteins in the last years. But uh, we are also seeing over the last two years, maybe even less, maybe over the last year, a different approach in which instead of defining a physical uh, chemical energy function, we directly learn with um, deep learning methods from the databases. I selected here three of the examples that I particularly like most, but there are many others. And every day I get into uh, Google Scholar or Twitter and there are more and more methods exploiting directly neural networks for protein design. Today I'm going to explore one perspective in which uh, I treat proteins as language. Uh, given that we have seen so many successes from the natural language processing field, we can also use all these methods for protein design. Uh, I will move this here now. Um, we have seen, or I've been hypothesizing over the last years that proteins and languages share many similarities. One of the most obvious is that they are organized in, similar, in a similar fashion. For example, we have Proteins are uh, composed of amino acids, and then uh, human languages like English, English, they are they also have an alphabet. Uh, then uh, letters in language form form words, and we also with amino acids with amino acids we are able to form a secondary structure, and these secondary structures form proteins the same way that words form sentences. These sentences carry a meaning the same way that proteins also carry a function. And lastly, we can, with sentences, we can build uh, paragraphs and text, uh, the same way that proteins also build and form uh, quaternary complexes. The similarities also span to, to other examples, like, uh, for example, a single typo in a sentence uh, 
is similar to a mutation which can lead to uh, an unstable protein. We can also in language change the order of uh, sub-sentences and then still have the same meaning, which is similar to a uh, biological permutation of sequences. Or um, this is a typical example in natural language processing field in which you can have a grammatically correct sentence, but that semantically doesn't make any sense. So like colorless green ideas sleep for sleep. So it's correct, but for us, it doesn't make any sense. Um, this is similar to some proteins that they do exist, but like, yeah, we don't know why. <laughs> of course, this doesn't work always perfectly. So there are things that don't have a correlation with languages, for example, in, in language, we don't have constraints. Like we can basically say whatever we want, except that maybe we cannot have a hundred consonants one after the other, but we don't have something like folding constraints. This is a problem that doesn't really well, it doesn't have a good analogous or also uh, multiple sequence alignments. Uh, because even if we have um, synonyms in languages, um, there's really nothing like a multiple sequence alignment, which is uh, one of the reasons why we have seen so much success over the years, for example, in a structure prediction like AlphaFold. So yeah, uh, there are analogies, but also we have to bear in mind that not everything works perfectly. Although I still believe that we can take all the similarities that languages and uh, proteins have and use that to build new proteins or do any other protein research predictive task. Um, this is not only my idea. I've seen that actually natural language processing has been having an impact on protein research for decades. So back in the days when people in the NLP field were using hidden Markov models, also in protein research, we were starting using hidden Markov models, for example, to do sequence classification or homology de detection like the software HH search. Later on, we were using uh, neural networks like uh, CNN or recurrent neural networks and same happened to proteins. And lastly, uh, the transformer, which is the architecture that I will focus on, was released in 2017. And since then, it has been applied to thousands, millions of architectures for languages, but also we have been using it a lot for proteins as well. What is in particular the transformer? This is the architecture that I've been using. Uh, the transformer was originally released by Google in 2017, and it, has, it was released as a machine translation method. So you have an encoder and a decoder, and the encoder is uh, the architecture, so the, the module that takes the input language, then it processes it, it's able to pass it to the decoder, and the decoder produces an output. Um, but then from here, uh, a lot of different groups started, or companies started taking this original architecture and doing modifications of it. One example is um, literally take uh, the encoder and have the decoder to speak Polish uh, from nothing. So like it's a, a machine that directly speaks or literally uh, shred the decoder and have an encoder that uh, given a sentence produces um, a vector. I have a look on Friday at how many models we have and Hugging Face is one of the repositories that where you can upload models like these transformers and only in like the two years that it's been up, it has hosted over 50,000. 55,000 models. So it's, it ha it's having an, a huge success, this type of architecture. And in protein research as well. So we recently review how these architectures are being applied for proteins and only in two years, they've been applied to all the ones that you see shadow in blue, they've been applied to proteins as well. I'm gonna focus on the UPT2 architecture, which is the one that I have applied. Um, how it all started in 2019, OpenAI is a company in California. They released a model. Well, they didn't release a model. They released a blog post saying that they had um, uh, implemented a model that was able to speak or generate text uh, with human capabilities. And they said that at the time that it was so powerful that it was dangerous so that they were not going to release the model because people could use it for fake news or their other misuses. Uh, when I read some of the examples, I found that it was the most amazing thing that I've read in my life because uh, the way it works is that you provide at the beginning of a sentence, for example, like in here, a train carriage containing controlled nuclear materials was stolen in Cincinnati today, its whereabouts are unknown. And then the, the network, uh, the model speaks in continuous. The incident occurred on the downtown train line 
which runs from Covington and Ashland stations. So I don't know, the first thing that I thought, okay, if you ever had to learn a second language, you know that it's remarkably complicated to get the grammar right, but this thing is grammatically correct. So this is already pretty impressive. But then I went to Google Maps and I look at Cincinnati and actually Covington and Ashlands are real stations. So this thing had got right the, like the map. <laughs> so it, it was able to, to understand that Cincinnati and Ashland and Covington are places on earth that you can connect with a train station. So it, I found this was pretty impressive for a model. So I thought, okay, if we have this control over generating text that makes sense, then maybe we can do the same with proteins. So this is how what I did. I literally apply an architecture very similar to this to the protein space so that we are able to speak proteins. Uh, the way I did it, because we have, as, as I showed at the beginning, many uh, an increasing amount of biological databases or uh, biological data. I took one of these databases, it's called Unirev50, in which we have protein data. There are 50 million protein sequences. So I split it into uh, 9010. So 45 for training, and then I remove the headers, the FASTA headers, which is what it tells you the name of the protein and the organism because they are usually written in Latin and I don't want to confuse the model. I took that out and then put a label. And then I tokenized the system. So um, the whole uh, input data into, well, for language it works usually very easily because we have words, but we don't have that in proteins. So I, I train a tokenizer. The tokenizer finds like small chunks of uh, amino acids that are repeated often in in uh, in nature. So it usually finds like three, four amino acids per token. And then after tokenizing, I trained this. Uh, I was very lucky to have early access to a, a GPU cluster that had just been bought. So uh, they needed testers, so I volunteered. And in four days uh, with access to 128 NVIDIA 100, I was able to train the model. And uh, I got ProGPT2 which is a model with uh, 36 layers and 338 million parameters that it's able to speak protein. Because I don't speak protein, I cannot tell how well it speaks. So usually when people train models like uh, GPT-2, they generate text and then they compare it to, um, well, they look at the grammar and they look whether it makes sense, uh, whether it's coherent. So we can do that because we speak English, but with proteins, I was just seeing letters and. Uh, I had to came up with different ways to validate whether the sequences are in fit. One way that I did is to look at whether the propensity of amino acids or the letters that it speaks uh, correlates well with the one that we see in nature. So I took uh, uh, the database that I had trained, unit 50, and look at how often every letter happens, so every amino acid. And I observed this is the distribution of amino acids, so it's mostly hydrophobic first. And then I look at this into, uh, this is a different way to plot it. So we see leucine and al alanine, valine, and so on. They, they happen first. And then I generated uh, from the model uh, different, uh, with different parameters, because it's a probabilistic model you can generate from it with different, in different ways. You can do a greedy search or a beam search and so on. So I'm showing here three, like 10 examples, but I did like thousands trying to find what is the generation parameter that produces a frequency that is the most similar to the one that we observe in nature, which is the one with the dark lines. And I found good parameters. Actually, they were described in a previous paper, so I could have just done that. Um, and then I got uh, then um, a set of parameters that can speak proteins the way that are in nature, and it can, um, generate thousands of proteins in minutes. <clears throat> so once I have done that, I wanted to see how these proteins compare to the ones that we see in nature. For that, I generated 10,000 proteins from the model from ProGPT2 and 10,000 sequences from Uniref. And I made sure that both uh, models or both data sets have sequences that are more or less domain size, so like 250 amino acids or less. And then I compare them first at the, uh, by looking at the sequences at the, uh, whether they are ordered and at their structural content. So first I, using UPRED, I, uh, we look at um, whether the sequences are, are predicted to be globular or disorder. And we observe that both datasets have the same frequency of globular domains, so 88 
percent or so, and uh, the same person of the same percentage of having ordered content. And then we we just separate to look at whether they are predicted to have the same amount of alpha pellicle, beta sheet, and coil content. And except that uh, the sequences from ProGPT are a little bit more helical, except from that they are in the same range. So that was good. And then I thought, okay, maybe the sequences are very much like the natural ones because they are literally the natural ones. So it will happen. Maybe I'm just memorizing them. Uh, like, you know, when, you, when we learn exams, we can do that too. Either you understand it or you just borrowed what you uh, studied. So I had a look at how, uh, uh, whether the identities of these generated sequences are very, how far away are from the, from the natural space. Due to that, I took Uniclus 30. And then I look at uh, for each protein in, on each data set at the distance in identities uh, for in the length. So how like what is the best heat that it finds in natural in Uniclos given given a, a certain length? So each point is one of the ten thousand sequences on the data set, and the average for ProGPT two is fifty four percent. So it means that uh, in average most of the sequences that it generates are uh, 50% identity far away from natural sequences. So they are in, it's not literally copied chunks of the training set. I also look at the training set. So it's generating something new that is looking like nature proteins, but it's far away from them. And to compare, I also look at the random data sets by concatenating random letters, just to see whether anything could be actually be natural like, but it, it isn't. And then I look at how, given that I have been working with the protein space in the past, and I had uh, given this representation of how proteins look in the protein universe, I plotted the same, the same network, and I had a look at where the new proteins are and how do they look like. And I'm selecting here six of them from different classes. In this case, they are all very structured. Well, uh, I did this, uh, the predictions with alcohol, and uh, we look at, uh, uh, some of them in different regions of the protein space. And one of the things that is more most uh, remarkable in here is that usually protein design produces uh, proteins that are very idealized with minimal loops and very short uh, secondary elements. But in here, the proteins are much more natural-like. So natural proteins have like big mm -hmm. loops and, um, sorry, and, uh, and like embodiments so that they are able to allocate function and they are flexible. So these proteins look much more like nature proteins. So this is something very important for the next step, which will be that they perform a function. Uh, the model is available. You can download it from Hanging Face uh, anytime. So go ahead <laughs> and you can have, give me feedback if you want um, or drop me an email. <laughs> and uh, I would like to say that what happens next, uh, what I've been doing is this part in which I take a database, I train ProGPT2, and then I am able to create new proteins that are in unseen regions of the protein space. Then um, I can also take, for example, you could take your family of proteins and you could fine tune the model so that it for a while only speaks proteins that are in, within this region so that we can explore the boundaries of the family. But another thing I haven't explored yet that now we could do is to take for every protein, produce a vector by looking at the attention heads of the transformer. And then this vector can either be passed to another uh, neural network for any prediction, like if we want to predict stability or binding, or we could also generate those sorts of proteins and um, run them because now in, with molecular dynamic simulations, because now we know that we can run several microseconds a day and then uh, discard some of them before we go to the lab. And another very important part of research that, uh, that still hasn't been explored much is to understand what the model is in, because it's like a big black box with uh, 700 million parameters. So to understand what the parameters are interpreting from the sequence, and when they generate an protein, what do they look like? And this would be very important to rationally understand what the model sees and how, uh, what it's encoding from, from the sequence and what are like principles to design the sequences without using the model. Um, and lastly, there was a release of a model, like very impressive model a couple of months ago. 
It is called Dali2, and it is able to generate an image directly from a text file prompt. For example, from the prompt, a bowl of soup that is a portal to another dimension as digital art, and it processes a figure like this. This also opens new doors for protein design because what we ultimately want is to have control over the design process. So we want to say, I want a function that hydrolyzes plastic. So literally, give me that. So we could potentially do that. Uh, I will say that as a summary from my this last part is ProGPT2 sequence explore unseen regions of the protein space while preserving natural like properties. Alpha fold prediction shows non idealized proteins with large loops and cavities. And it doesn't need further training. You can use it, it generates sequences. You can also fine tune your family and then it will explore the boundaries of the same family. And lastly, which is what I'm doing now, inclusion of tags. So annotation of proteins will allow to uh, link every protein to a function. And then from this function, we could generate proteins that uh, have this, this property. Yeah, so I would like to thank uh, the people that I've been working with over the years, uh, the people, uh, my, my group during my PhD and Pfizer for my, uh, uh, my short postdoc, and then uh, the group I work in, uh, in Germany, uh, Professor Hock is here, so many thanks for the amazing years I had in Germany, and now uh, the University of Girona and Aga La Gente Estatal de Investigación for funding. And lastly, special thanks to the BioInfo for Women uh, framework for allowing me to present and Alfonso for inviting me. And uh, as a note, I collected some data on how many or like the proportion of women that are currently working at high level at uni Spanish universities. And I looked at only 25 of the full professors in Spanish universities are women, but this is really much a much lower number in informatics departments or electronics departments like the one that I am, which is only like 13%. Or if we look at ICREA, only 20% of ICREA researchers are women. So thanks, special thanks to buy for women because numbers are getting better, but there is still a lot of work to do. And thanks to you for listening, also to the online people. If you have any questions, just uh, I'm here. So thank you very much. Thank you, Nadia. I think this has been a very impressive talk, at least for me. So is there any question from the audience here or online? Please, if online, raise your hand or, or write in the chat. We will start from here with uh, Miguel. Well, I don't work. Yeah, I'm. I'm actually don't work much with enzyme engineering. So, like, I know there are many groups doing that, but I, I don't know how well it works today. I, I mostly work on the structural aspect. Yeah, sorry. Maybe I can find information. Okay. No, I, I'll get back to you. Oh, for like binding yeah. for yeah for like if it's if it's not an enzymatic reaction for that I know. In general, okay, yeah. I mean, for binding kinetics, um, yeah, I would say on rates we're working very well because we have a lot of data on how a ligand, for example, approaches or another protein approaches the, the or forms the complex. But for the off rates, it's still off. Like maybe we were seeing one order of magnitude off because we don't have that much data that samples the way out from the Markov modeling. But it's in the order of magnitude. Yeah, yeah, that's what we observed back in the days. Okay. Maybe it's now better, but this was a work that we did back in 2016. For the on rates, already in 2011, from one of the first papers doing legal binding for uh, with MD, they already got very good matching parameters because it's much faster. That's great. Yeah, for biochemical and enzymatic reactions, so Michael is meant tonight. Okay. Just for, for the following questions, maybe um, if you can repeat a little bit, a yeah. summarized version of the questions so that people can. can I realize, can yeah. I will continue one of the questions in the in the chat. So, David Cirillo, also a postdoc from here from the Alfonso's group, he says, 
how big on average are the fragments that you found to be good for chimeric protein design? Did you observe some kind of structural hierarchy, such as blocks that are composed of smaller blocks that are composed of smaller blocks and so on? Very good question. Uh, yes, so how big they are. Uh, I don't have, uh, or maybe I didn't bring, or not in this presentation, the data, but on average, most of the fragments are around from 40 to 60 amino acids, but we also have some large fragments. And yes, we observed that some fragments are super fragments of other fragments. So, it, and there is a paper actually on that from Rachel Kolodny on how they explored that from the beta propeller, it goes expanding from um, the blades to two modules and so on up to eight or six. And yeah, so we observed that. But uh, for chimera genesis, we usually like larger fragments because they are easier to work with in the lab once you create the chimeras. So those that have been experimentally characterized, they had fragments over 60 and even more. So some people argue they are actually domains, mm -hmm. but potentially you could also use shorter fragments. And that relates to a question now from Alfonso. Uh, great work and very good talk. So the first part of your talk, what will you do with the chimeras? What is the evolutionary relationship between the units that were transferred and the original one? And what's the level of similarity? Okay, what will I do with the chimera? Well, thank you for, for the nice words. What will I do with the chimeras? Oh, first of all, this was a proof of principle to see whether they actually work. Uh, there are very few cases of, of chimeras that have been formed with different fragments of different falls. So seeing that it worked was already good. Uh, the next step was, was to see whether we could do enzymes. So bringing two fragments with two ligands together and, and putting them into the correct orientation, hoping that were, that reacts. That so far didn't work. That's super, super challenging. But uh, transferring the ligand from the parents, <coughs> that worked well in the lab. Um, what is the evolutionary relation between the units? So we observed, we use HA search. So um, we only took uh, fragments that had a high confidence value from, from a value, so or in HA search them over 70%. Um, and then those also besides that they had a very uh, good RMSC, so they were not only evolutionary or in sequence homologous, but also they were structurally uh, super impossible. And um, the units that were transferred in the original one. Um, the way we actually do the chimeras is whenever we find a fragment in common, we stick them from the fragment and then we cut the chimera from, so we find fusion points in these fragments. And then the two fragments that we bring together, they aren't related or they, they aren't necessarily related. It's the fragment that we, that we link that is related. Yeah, I hope this answer <laughs> my question. So if not, the, the, the aspect can, can So we have another uh, question here in the audience. Okay. Yeah. Can, oh, oh, I can try to summarize. Yeah. So, if I understand correctly, the question is how do you know that your protein language is really able to recreate the grammar of the protein language, given that you don't speak protein and you are taking it from what it is there? But as I understood, there is no test to see how accurate the syntaxis that you're producing with your model is correct to design these proteins. Well, I understood it more in the sense of meanings of function, right? Okay. Okay. No, no, I don't. I, I don't. Meaning or grammar. Um, I think about the grammar level. So first, I this this language, this uh, this protein language model hasn't been trained on functional data like the Go terms. So at the moment, it speaks grammatically correct sentences in the sense that they are very similar in properties like the ones that I showed to natural proteins. But I agree that we don't know if they have meaning because we, in the lab, we are only testing whether they fall, whether they express and so on, but not whether they catalyze a reaction. 
So in that sense, we don't know. What I'm, that's what I'm doing next. I want to train the model by having also labels so that we can uh, literally speak. So the control will be like, uh, write a text on politics. <laughs> And then we can do that. So the, the similar thing will be that in proteins, I say, please, I need a membrane protein. And then it does that. That's, that's the next step. For that, I need to train the model with um, me. But besides that, I don't know. Like, I think the set of parameters or like the set of validation examples that I've shown and some others that we've done during the revision of the manuscript, uh, they show that the proteins are uh, very, so they have almost identical properties to natural ones. So I would say that it speaks grammatically correct proteins. Yeah, I see where you're coming from. I mean, I would say from the biological perspective, if you speak a random sequence from this enormous um, uh, space, the chances that it forms a structure in 3D are zero. <laughs> so what I show is that the proteins that uh, my model speaks, they have a, a, a structure. So in a sense, it picks uh, in this space, those points that in 3D produce a meaningful uh, structure, which is challenging because it's, the space is astronomically large. So yeah, but we, I guess we can, or maybe I'm not understanding. Yeah, maybe we, we can just speak. Just I would love to hear more. Layer, just give the space to someone else. There was Victor Wayar. He had a question and now he starts fast it. Victor? Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. You can open your mic, yeah. Yeah, I think I just did, yeah. Uh, uh, thanks, Elia. It's good to see you again and, and uh, yeah. really nice to see your, your progression from your PhD studies. So, so I, I like in particular your combining the ML and the ML because we, we that's what we are betting as well. So I like I like to know your opinion on that. And, and and for example, we are we are we did some some new enzymes using BAs, and and then passing through molecular modeling to select promiscuity, and and and, and it, you can really filter them, and you can really now tell the guy okay, express me these 10, 10 enzymes, and they express some of them very nicely, and they are very promiscuous, but they are most of the time on the order of promiscuity of 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 the best enzymes that we see in nature. And when we see the last three papers on, on, on GANs or, or BAs on, on, um, in, uh, on, on creating new sequences, and, and these are very nice because as you say, 60%, 50% of sequence is similar, but the other 40% is different. Activities are always like 10% higher. Uh, you know, it's not a huge change. And then, so, so how, how you think my question is how do you think this can make an impact? And, and, and again, I'm, I, 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 we are betting on it. I think it's, it's very nice. But then we, I talk to the European agencies and I talk to people and say, no, now we are shifting to metagenome. We are shifting to identifying those enzymes that nature has done that for, for millions of years. And they are up there and they are significantly much more improved than, and like a thousand times more improved than what you have now because this guy was growing in this volcano or something like that. So. So the examples we have in the last two years are, it's nice, they, they give a little bit of kick, sometimes in, in specificity, a little kick on, on the more stability, etc. But, but on the other side, we have this um, genomic, uh, existing genomic that we can buy a prospect and then we can apply a little bit of directed evolution, for example, and, and just improve it a little bit. So, so how you sell it to them? 
Okay, well, I haven't designed any enzyme yet. <laughs> this is this full disclosure. <laughs> but I, I truly believe we can look this. Uh, I think there is an enormous gap from what the A community is doing. Uh, for example, in video image, video processing and language processing and image processing versus what we biologists or people or computer scientists, chemists, we are doing in, in the lab. But it, it will happen. Uh, when I see, uh, the deep fakes or the control that we have over generating new videos or generating new images from the example that I show, like with Dali, and the control that at the moment we already achieved by writing a short uh, prompt of text and then getting um, the, the image. I think with models like that, that they haven't yet been applied to proteins, we can in the next years reach a much better uh, control. Of course, nature has done a great job uh, with enzymes and they are really proficient so we'll have to see how how well it um, matches but I, I believe I am I strongly believe we'll we'll see um, major advances in for example applying methods like the deep fakes to literally generate uh, conformers of proteins that are that have a function and uh, how to couple that with MD which is one of the questions you mentioned um, I see MD more like a filtering process, but this is my personal opinion at the moment. So like we, that we can generate thousands of them and then also in, in a high throughput fashion, filter thousands of them out and then only proceed with the best ones. But this needs benchmarking and... And, and you don't think they, they could feed back the generative model because what we are maybe. trying to do is, what we're trying to do is to get these descriptors from the molecular modeling. Maybe MD is not the best one because even if it's fast, but it's still it's still expensive, but maybe structural methods or some bioinformatics that you can obtain the scriptures and fit them back into the generative. So now the generative is more restricted. And, 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 and so besides yeah. your language, you add into the vector some, some information that might drive the, the search. I mean, there are in fact a few end-to-end -end differentiable uh, molecular mechanics um, frameworks now, like TorchMD or something. So, so it can potentially couple and reinforce learning but i haven't like i believe in that but i, I for how to couple md to the training process i will need to to read more but i i, I would love to talk more if you want at some point yeah you, you have to visit one day in the lab we'll, we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll make you a gift okay <laughs> thank you we have another two quick questions here from the audience please don't really ask so we can have time for more people okay so uh, i don't have much i don't have any background Yeah, both are great questions, actually. The tokenizer question, I get it a lot. And now I wonder whether it made sense. To me, it made sense back in the time when I trained the model because this model had performed very well with language by using BPE over one hot encoding. And then I thought, okay, the same happens with proteins. But then it turns maybe it didn't because it, with a single mutation, then now the tokenizer would change the, the set of tokens. So next, next model I'm training, it won't have a tokenizer. And then for the second question, which was the analogy of uh, natural pre-trained model. Pre model. Yes, I did that, and it actually worked well, but it overtrained. So I I pass a pass um, thousands of labodoxins to the model to GPT two, and over time I, I realized I don't know why it, it wasn't overtraining theoretically from the course, but it was just spitting chunks of labodoxins that were in the training set. So, but I didn't look it further. So maybe. So people have been doing that, like taking an English word and applying to German. That theoretically can work a bit. Yeah, I did that. I did that. It it is it was spitting chunks of the. Um, so I thought it was a long shot, like going from yeah <laughs> from English to protein. So, so I'm spending more time fine tuning than training from scratch. There's another question here from Camila. Yes, very nice talk. Thank you. Uh, so my question is. I understood that the problem of generating like the novel proteins is the most challenging mm -hmm. one. And I'm trying now to understand what the gain you have in exploring regions of the sequence space that were like never explored. Because what I'm thinking is that you can find something that has the same function of another sequence that already exists and was validated by by 
function and you know it performs only this function and not the else, <coughs> you cannot be sure about this group, uh, about the new system <coughs> that you can create, even if it has the function. So what would be the, the gain you have in using this new sequence, this new protein, instead of one that already exists to perform a function that you already know that yeah. you don't, yeah, what is exactly uh, the question is what is the benefit on a, on on finding these sequences in the middle of the um, unexplored regions of the protein space if they could end up having the same function as regions that are well validated? Yes, I agree. If they have this, well, um, I think that the major gain will be if we find functions that have um, that are unnatural, that that a new function entirely functions like catalytic reactions that. Yeah, at this stage, it simply speaks. So, I, if it's a completely new function, there is no way we're gonna know it. But I also see that if we were training with labels, if you can, if you combine labels like membrane plus catalytic or something, this could be potentially a new uh, way, and uh, maybe it's a new function. And then theoretically, we know. So, it's a way to test whether we have control in this aspect, like property, like. Uh, cell location plus uh, a function, catalytic function, for example. I totally agree that at the moment it's a long shot and I don't expect the proteins that I'm generating in the, well, we are, we are testing some, but like at the moment it's only to see whether they structurally are fit, which is already a big, uh, big achievement. But yeah, I, agree. I mean, hope is that they eventually do functions that we don't have in nature. Yeah, because I read the papers, mm -hmm. and this hallucination thing, they all generate that are totally new, but they are the same copy of something that already exists, or the same principle, like a different core, a different membrane core yeah. that is as more physics, but it's similar to something that we Yeah, I mean, at this stage, we are only like mostly doing well. Like, I think we have reached a control of over the design process at the structural level, but function is going to take years. But there, are a couple, there was another paper right after the hallucination one in which they were able to create new faults, so faults that haven't been, they don't have any function at the moment or that we know, but like they are topologies that aren't present in, in nature or that we know. Okay, I think we are on time. I don't know, Alfonso, do you think it's time for another question or shall we finish here? <laughs> You will know better what are the local conditions uh, from from whom I have time, but <laughs> I don't know the how. Okay, how we have just for the last question and we we'll close. That is in chat. No idea. What's the next step challenge for the language models being applied to protein sequences? Because he says many people are doing this now. So where do you think this is going forward? Yeah, as I mentioned, I think uh, including functions, so that we have at the moment the model speaks or most models speak, but they we don't have control over what they speak. So it could generate any type of text. But a big thing is that we are able to tell the model, please um, write something in this direction so that we have control over the design process, which is what we ultimately want to produce a solution for industry or healthcare. Okay, yeah. I think there's a lot of future. Let's see where it goes to. So thanks everyone who has came here in person or who has connected online. Uh, and wait for you here for the next seminar in the Bagin Thank you. Thank you. Gracias, Noelia. Gracias.